Hello and welcome. My name is Georg Link. I am here at the Open Info Days Mexico 2022 to talk about squashing diversity, equity, and inclusion bugs in open source projects. This takes an approach of thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in a way that is using how we fix issues in software to also how we can fix issues in our communities and make them more welcoming and inclusive. I will share with you an approach that will help us move through certain steps. The resources at the end will give you everything that you need so you can do this in your projects as well. So it's very hands-on and practical and is backed up by research. Why is this important? When we look at the four opens, the open infrast philosophy on open source, we know that it is very important to have an open source license. Open source can only exist if the software is licensed with an open source license. That's a technical legal requirement. Now, open infra says this is not enough. We can't just say, hey, this software is open source. Users have the permission to use it, to uh, change it, to share their changes and read the source code. No, we also want in our project to have an open design, which is about letting go of the control of the design of the software and its feature roadmap and accepting that it should be driven by the community. So an open infra project, we welcome everyone's requirements. You know, what do you need in your work? What do you need this software to do? And let's have those voices shape what the software is going to be and what we are developing. So the focus is now shifting from requirements about the, the software to people and what they need. Now, how do we make sure people can actually bring in their own uh, needs? This is through open development, the, four, the, the third open, which is about adopting transparent and inclusive development processes that enable everyone to participate as an equal on a level playing field. Now we are very much looking at people and how can we get everyone engaged in the design in the development of our software project and so now now we have we want everything to be open and transparent we want everyone to participate we will create the processes for them to do this and the last open open community is about ensuring that the community is a cohesive inclusive level playing ground where all the voices are heard and anyone can rise to a leadership position now we are saying we want everyone to be here we want to be welcoming we want to have you know different backgrounds different uh different people so in open infra we want to be welcoming and inclusive, and there is a commitment to make this happen. Now, if we back up a little bit and look at diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source, this is a big topic that has got a lot of attention over the last five years. In 2017, GitHub survey showed that 95% of respondents to their survey were men. There's a huge gender imbalance. In Mozilla, uh, another community had a better ratio, 58% men, 33% women, 9% who identified differently. Um, and then even when we look at an open infra project, OpenStack, the report from 2018 showed that 10% identified as women. So 90% as men and others. So the, and the ratio here is in code contributions, it's even a little bit less. And then in leadership and governance, it's more, which, which is good, right? We want to have um, some examples in leadership positions that can 
lead the way and help improve overall. Now, this is as a problem when open source is mostly developed by men, then these men have certain biases, certain way of thinking that is built into how the projects are created, how they're documented. So let's see from those figures from four or five years ago, how are we doing today? Well, the Linux Foundation survey from last year found that still 82% of men, 82% of respondents were men. Now, there are some, some hope, hopeful uh, things. Uh, open source is becoming very welcoming and inclusive. 82% of respondents felt welcome. However, there is a discrepancy in who feels that way. Certain backgrounds have a harder time. And we see this again when we see that 22% of respondents disagree that equal opportunities exist. People with different backgrounds have different opportunities to participate in decision-making processes, in influencing the roadmap, in deciding where things go in the community. Now, th there are different things that the background, um, that, that make up a person's background. One of the challenges that we see time and time again is language. 81% of people can read or write English well. There are many who perceive English to be a participation barrier because a lot of open source comes from the United States and is written in English. Uh, there are also open source projects in other languages. I'm a native German speaker and so I can participate in the German open source projects and English. But let's say if we're here at the Open Infra Days Mexico, if you have a Spanish project, I would not be able to participate because Yes, I'm learning Spanish, but I'm, I'm nowhere near good enough to participate. And if any of you listening might have experienced this as well, that you found an open source project that was in a language you are not very comfortable in. So that's just one of the things that um, we know. We also know that it's not just language, it's other identity aspects as well. So who you are has an impact on your ability to participate in open source. There are several recommendations for what we can do. And I want to share with you today a very specific process that you can adopt, but just in general, some, some ideas for what projects are doing already to become more welcoming and inclusive. One is to have and enforce a code of conduct. This is a document that says, here is how we expect people to behave when they're participating in our project. You know, be kind to each other, be open, don't use offensive language. And when we do identify toxic behavior, we are committed to countering that and to say, hey, I noticed you were being unkind. Can you please change your behavior? And if you don't, then maybe we don't want you in the community. Now that's an extreme case, right? Most times people don't even know that what they just said or did was offensive or it was in the heat of the moment. They can apologize. It's all good. We can also enact structural changes in our projects. Open source is very much built around coding and software development and the Git history, Git log. And we want to recognize that there are a lot of people in open source who are not software developers, who are helping with issue bug triaging, who are helping with organizing events, answering questions, being there for others. and those, you know, testing the software, writing bug reports. 
uh, translating. There are a lot of different ways that people participate in open source and we want to recognize those and have our project set up where we're not just focused on the developer, but everyone who participates. Another recommendation is to create identity groups. Have people who have similar backgrounds get together and talk about the issues that they perceive or in solutions they have found and have a group of people they can connect to that understand the same challenges. Uh, we can improve the documentation and I'll give you an example here in a bit for how this can be done. We can provide a space for newcomers. Having a newcomer space, a welcome channel on our instant messaging where people can introduce themselves. Hey, just I'm new here. And we can say, oh, yes, welcome. That's great. And then also it lowers the anxiety for asking a question that uh, you might think, oh, I, I should find this question by myself. You know, let's create a space where it's okay to ask those questions and where we as a community are okay to answering the same question time and time again. Which then, if we find ourselves answering the same question, maybe we need to improve our documentation, website and installation guide and whatever, so that that question is already answered. So it's, it's a way that we can learn. You know, let's create an environment where we can get that feedback and learn. We also can localize efforts. One is to avoid jargon and that keeps people out who are not familiar with the jargon, but also that makes it easier to translate the software, the documentation, the website and so on. And it might be good to have local user groups, local teams across the world that are specific to that region. So one of the the last thing I want to share is to take a data-driven approach to learning and improving. Only if we know how we are doing today and identifying where the bottlenecks are and where we are maybe not doing so well, can we see if any changes we make actually lead to improvements because then we can go measure again and can see, oh, yes, there was an improvement. So we're not guessing. All right, this was background on diversity, equity, inclusion in open source and showing that there is the a bias in who is participating in open source today. And this is something that we want to fix, we can fix. Um, and so let's go into squashing DEI bugs, where we follow a similar process from other bug finding and fixing process. First, we need to identify that there is a bug. Then we want to investigate, find out, you know, what's the root cause? Why is this happening? To then come up with ideas to solve it. And we can actually improve. Now, the, the method that I'm sharing with you, Gender Mag, I learned from Anita Sama. She is a professor at Oregon State University. I've worked with her on a couple of projects. And she has done research in this. So this method is based on scientific evidence that works. So let's go do an example for what this method actually is and how it works. So in this example, we have a user that comes to our project and finds a typo. It's like, oh, okay, uh, I can fix this. I know how to spell this word correctly. How do I actually go about suggesting that change and fixing it? So let's say this person goes to our readme and finds a section called help us with code. Not really fixing documentation, but okay, there is help us. So let's see what it says. Hi, if you're willing to contribute with code to this project, these are the simple steps you must follow to get your local machine ready for development. Tough, easy, and simple. These steps are estimated to take up to 30 minutes. Now, this person wanted to only change a typo, not set up a full development to test and run the software. So it's really a little overkill expecting 30 minutes of setup time just for this. So now that we've identified, okay, someone who has a contribution that is does not require source code, 
let's offer a different way of helping us. So let's add a section to the README that says work on documentation. That not only says, hey, we're also welcoming fixes to our documentation, but here are the actual steps that you can take. And someone who is new and unfamiliar with GitHub workflow might very much appreciate it. I'll come back to this example. Now, let's go through the steps. Discover, uh, understand, and resolve. One of the first things we need to do is focus our efforts. Decide on, okay, what do we want to improve? Do we want to improve our issue tracker? Do we want to improve our readme? Do we want to improve our tutorial? After we identified what we want to improve, let's find out what newcomers to the project actually want to do there. With an issue tracker, maybe they want to find a good first issue to start contributing. On the readme, maybe they want to understand what the software does and install the software. On the tutorial, maybe they want to get started using the software. So let's figure out what we want to explain. And let's document what are the steps needed to actually achieve this. So let's say we have a goal to make changes to the readme as a contribution to the project. Now, a sub goal for this is we need to actually edit the readme file. Now, let's assume we are in GitHub. So we can click on the edit button and change the readme file. And then at the bottom of it, it has a field that says describe the commit changes and save commit. Now, as someone who is coming from not GitHub, I, I might be confused. Why do I need to make a commit? I just want to save the file. Those are the kinds of things that will come up once we walk through this. But for now, let's just document what needs to happen. Now, after saving the changes, there is another step. So we need to also submit a pull request, which if we are familiar with GitHub, we know that is how changes are suggested to an open source project because the maintainers can then review the change before they accept it. So we write down what are the steps needed to make uh, to reach a certain goal. The last step to preparing is to then identify who the newcomer is. What perspective do you want to take? Now, research has found five uh, the, these five characteristics are significantly different between men and women. I'm not saying that they're all men or women, but I'm just saying research has shown there to be a, a difference on average. One is motivation. Do you engage in the project by, for enjoyment or because it's part of your work, you need to accomplish something? There's uh, information processing style where women are looking more to understand the whole contribution process before they start and men are okay with, okay, I understand how to do this step. Let's do it. Let's find out what I need to learn next and follow along. So if you're following a tutorial to follow along as you're reading, that's selective. Whereas comprehensive is you read the whole thing first, understand what is expected and then start working through it. The third is learning style for new technology. Men are typically more tinkerers who are okay with trying something out and if it fails, backtrack and try again. Women are typically more reflective and trying to think, okay, what am I expecting to happen here? Is this gonna work? How does that fit in with the next steps? Computer self-efficacy is the fourth one, is how comfortable are you or do you see yourself with working with open uh, with, with technology, just in general, you know? How comfortable am I with it? And the last one is risk aversion with technology. Are you okay with things breaking and then fixing it again later? Or do you try to only do what you're absolutely certain will work 100% of the time and try to avoid getting into trouble. Now, all of these are somehow connected 
And research has shown men and women have significant differences here. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If 82% of people in open source are men and they write the software and the documentation for their way of thinking and approaching problems, then it's very difficult for someone who has a different problem solving style and different perspective to follow along and they might be left out. So we want to take that implicit bias that is in our open source and fix it. So let's figure out, I'll give you the resources later for how to build these perspectives so you can do this yourself. Now that we've prepared to understand, uh, to discover, let's understand. Uh, ideally, you do this in a team of three. You can do it by yourself, but it's better if you have others who see different perspectives. What you do is you take that persona, this different perspective that you're taking, and think about, okay, I am now someone who does not like to tinker. I don't click on something if I don't understand what it is. I am only here because I need to do something very specific and anything that is different, I'm, I might be hesitant to even do something about it, okay? So we take that perspective and now we walk through the steps, the sub goals um, and ask, okay, for the sub goal that we documented, is this newcomer actually forming this sub goal? So with our example, we had the goal is to edit the readme and the first sub goal is to edit the readme. Okay. The second sub goal is create a pull request. So why would someone follow, uh, you know, make, figure out, yes, this is the sub goal I need to do or not. Is it, uh, you know, maybe the information processing style is I did not expect to make a pull request. Why, why is it asking me this? So I abort, go back to the readme and I'm like, but I already hit the save button or the commit button. Why is it not here? You know, is the, is that sub goal being formed and why not? Maybe we can select that in here for why that might not be. Then action. Will I know to click on this and will I actually do it? Do I feel comfortable taking that step, clicking here, making that change? Again, if part of my persona is to not be tinkering with it and I don't know what it does, then I would have a, no, this person would not do it. And reason is because the, the learning style is, I, I, I need to know the whole process. I'm not tinkering. And I, we can check this off. And since you're doing this in a team, you can have different people on your team saying, yes, I think this is a motivation problem, or this is a computer self-efficacy problem or not. And, and so then you collect all this in the end. Lastly, you look at, okay, now that this action is taken, does the person get the right feedback to know that what they've done was correct and they have reached their sub goal or they've gotten a step closer? Yes or no? Or are they missing information? Or is it implied but not explicitly stated that a file was saved or a process was started or whatever? Now, each every time you have these checkboxes that relate back to that persona, motivation, information processing style, and so on. This is important for this last step, resolve, because now we can see which issues did we have problems with and were those problems tied to someone's problem solving style, to their persona. What we then can do is say, okay, this is a general problem that anyone would have had. And these are problems that certain people who have a certain way of thinking and problem solving run into. Like what we had in our example, someone who just wants to do a documentation fix uh, has the motivation, um, you know, they don't want to 
set up a whole development environment. They just want to fix that issue. So in your team, discuss why certain steps are an issue for the persona you just walked through and discuss solution approaches. And then you can figure out, okay, how do we improve this? Do we need to add more documentation? Do we need to change the interface? Uh, do we need to rearrange information in our tutorial? Um, do we need more, you know, do we have uh, a quick TLDR? Uh, too long, didn't read, you know, TLDR, where you just say, here's what you will do. And then let's go into explaining later. So you already have the steps laid out beforehand. There are different things that you can think about doing, depending on what you discovered. And then you can repeat this process for different personas, different personalities. And I will give you a link to a toolkit where you can build these personas. So this brings me to the end of this process. Um, we want to discover where our projects are not welcoming, inclusive, easy to use for people with different problem solving styles. Understand why that is, what in someone else's perspective is preventing them from taking that next action or even figuring out that what the next action should be. And then we can start resolving these things in our communities and make them more welcoming and inclusive. Now I promised you resources, here it is. Uh, gendermag.org is the website where you can read up on the research that is backing up this approach, uh, where you can learn about what it is about men and women that they're thinking differently and how that results in biases in open source projects and why they might be difficult to use and to approach for certain people. The website also has a kit to do this walkthrough and the forms that you saw with the check marks and yes, maybe no, and sub goals, uh, actions, action result. You also have the customizable personas. There are the, the five elements with motivation, information processing, and so on um, that are already pre-built. Uh, and then there are some customization around it where you can give them different names and different backgrounds and so on and so forth. There are also flyers and webinars and trainings where you can learn more. So my hope is that today you got the idea that, hey, we can make open source projects, the projects we are involved in more welcoming and inclusive. Here is a step-by-step -step process. It's something that we just need to do. It's not hard, it's not difficult. And here are specific steps that we can take that go beyond the feel good recommendations, if I can say so. These are real actionable things that uh, we have seen projects improve by following these steps. So my name is Georg Link. I would welcome connecting with you, talking about this um, or any other related topic around community metrics and measuring communities and community health. I'm also in the Chaos Project and I work at Biturgia. So yeah, happy to connect with you. Let me know what you think, if this was helpful and have a great rest of your Open Infra Days Mexico 2022. Thank you. Bye.